Fire Call, the Fire Safety Show with Division Chief Jim Sedaris. Hi, my name is Division Chief Jim Sedaris, and you're watching Fire Call, and we're going to take you with the troops. Look at some of the training we're doing, look at some of the things going out with Sioux Falls Fire Rescue. So kick back, turn off all that electronic crap, you don't need it. You just sit down and watch Fire Call for the next half hour. Now I got some shout outs. Some of you have been writing saying, hey, give me a shout out to my department. So we'll nail out some of those real quick here. This first shout out is from James. And James wants a shout out to the North Patatogi Fire Department in New York. And the next one is from Luke. Luke lives in Ohio. He has a shout out to the Highland Hills Fire Department in Northeast Ohio. And then we have last shout out goes to Alex. Alex wants a shout out to the Upper Greenwood Lake Volunteer Fire Company of West Milford, New Jersey. So I'm glad you guys are watching. Glad you're sitting back and spent some time and asking us some questions, giving us some shout out. This show is going to be really cool. What we're going to look at is we're going to look at firefighting. Everyone likes to look at some tip time, getting some firefighting training done. We're also going to take a look at foam. How does that whole foam issue work? And let's get rid of some of those myths about foam. And then we're going to look at how one person can change one child's life. We're going to look at someone who 30 years ago, actually maybe a little longer, made an impression on someone and can really change a life. So sit back, take some time out of your life to spend with Sioux Falls Fire Rescue. <laughs> this question comes from Noah. Noah lives in Batavia, Illinois, and he wants to know when firefighters come to a fire, do they have specific jobs to do? And I got Captain Travis Tom. And Trav, your last month you were doing trench rescue. This month you're doing house fires. What's the deal? It's the job of a training officer, Jim. Oh, man, you do a darn good job, my friend. Darn Thank you. Good. Okay. Pull up to a, to a fire. Do we have specific jobs? <clears throat> or not? No. I kind of know the answer, but I want you because I like it so much, Trav. <laughs> well, we do. We carry four personnel on all of our trucks in Sioux Falls. And uh, each person on that truck has a responsibility at a structure fire, uh, depending on the situation. But uh, most of our fires, one firefighter stops at the fire hydrant okay. to catch the hydrant. Water supply? Yep. The next firefighter would be in charge of taking all the hoses off the truck. Okay. The officer of the position rides in the right front. His job is to scene size up in the, the tactics of attacking the fire. Becoming the incident uh, commander. Incident commander at the scene. Yep, and then the okay. engineer or driver is in charge of making water. So once once everyone gets that together, they all, so that way we don't have a lot of confusion. Everybody knows exactly what they're supposed to be doing. Saves mm -hmm. time, saves lives. Figured out in the morning before they even get on the truck. Mm -hmm. And what's this drill doing now? Are you reinforcing some of those concepts? Uh, yes and no. So, uh, most of this is for uh, tactics. Okay. Fire tactics we're learning about here and practicing. And um, this is a, kind of a different operation where we actually have live victims inside and we're practicing what we call a fast attack or rescue mode. Okay. Great. And well, thanks, Trav. You bet. This next question comes from Patrick. Patrick lives in Bellevue, Washington. He wants to know specifically, he's seen the Halligan tools. He's seen the Halligan tools and axes carried together. He wants to know how are they used? which is used most often, and I got big Brian Kringstead here to talk all about it. So tell us, Brian, what do you got? Uh, I got a flathead axe and the halligan. And you carry them. Put, now, yep. Pat probably wants to know how we do this. That just makes it easier yep. for you to carry? Yep. When you, when you put them together like that, it's called irons. So if somebody tells you to go grab the irons, that means you grab the halligan and the flathead axe. Okay. Put now, them together. How are they used? Well, the, flat, the halligan here is pretty versatile. Um, you, you see it's got a lot of ends on it, and it's mostly a, a prying tool. Uh, we use it for that. So Jam we're talking about jamming, opening a door? Yeah, jamming in the door. Um, you can print, you see uh, pointy in here, you can slam that down on a car hood, jack it up, crumple that hood back, spray some water on a car fire. Okay. Um, if we want to do ventilation on a roof, we can slam the point in, in the roof, and we can stand on this end. Gives a lot more grip on a on a steep roof. Okay, and then, so, and then you have your flathead axe, so you can use yep. that just to bang it in a little harder. Absolutely, you can uh, put the side in the door, and then you can use the flathead axe on here, get more advantage, even more leverage. Now, is it true? The guys told me that you actually bent one of these. <laughs> is that true? That is not true. Okay. That is a myth. Just checking. 
<laughs> Thanks a lot, Brian. I have a question from Jonathan, and Jonathan lives in Holly, New York. Jonathan wants to know about how long does it take to put a fire out inside of a house, basic house fire. I have Captain Ron Harris with me. Captain Ron's out here training the troops. What do you, what do you think, about how long does it take to put out a house fire? Well, if you pull up on scene, by the time you stretch the lines out and actually get everything up to the door, water in your hose, entering, going through the building, probably 20 minutes would be, I'd say, the average, let's say the average house fire. And then now uh, we're going to be at the scene, though, much longer. Yes, a lot of times people see us there for two hours, three hours later, but then that, then we have to do some overhaul, which means, you know, we got to go in and we got to actually get into the seat of the fire, find out where it is, where it went make sure it doesn't restart again. Mm -hmm. So it takes a lot of time then, and also to tear everything down, get back in, you know, back so, at the station. So when you talk about tearing things down, why do we tear things down? Why do we pull down some walls or some ceilings? Well, the biggest thing is extension. You know, uh, fire is going to go anywhere, you know, inside, especially if you got different types of construction. The one we, we, look, we look at is that balloon construction sure. where you don't have any fire stops inside. Where Older homes. The fire, yep, the fire goes up the wall, and then it just goes to the next floor, and on up, and on up in the attic. So we have to go through each area, tear a little bit out, just so we can see where the fire actually stopped. Mm -hmm. And from that point, then we can finish our overhaul and call it a, a, a stop, a fire stop. That's that's going to be a whole nother show just on building yep. construction. <laughs> yep. <laughs> Thanks, Ron. Okay. This question comes from Aaron, and Aaron lives in Chicago. Aaron wants to know, tell us about yourself and why. You know, what are the, some of the things that made you want to be a firefighter? And of all people today. We were shooting, came to have sandwiches at Whiffers. My third grade teacher is here, and I don't even know your first name, just Mrs. Randall. Mrs. Randall Whiffer. That, that's, oh, really? Whiffer. My nickname. Oh, oh, now I know. Cecilia. Really? I never knew. <laughs> no, but, honey, when you were in grade school, <laughs> it was always Mrs. I know. And, oh, yes. and it still is. Yes. Well, here's the story. In third grade, you started teaching and you took us on a tour of the fire station at the air base and that's when I, I was just enthralled with fire trucks and ever since then and look at me now uh, there and, you are and you have one of the nicest sandwich shops in sioux falls well thank you <laughs> <laughs> from teacher to entrepreneur well now going back don't say what year it was but it was 68. mrs randall i'm dating you jim i'm sorry I'm but, proud of it. But, but of course, then in Sioux Falls, you could be a teacher at what twelve? Because you had to be a, you had to be twelve years yes, old when you were yes, teaching us. Yeah, definitely. And <laughs> <laughs> and tell us what's happened. Did you? How long did you teach for? I taught in the public system one year. I went to the Catholic system because I could teach half days. Mm -hmm. I taught about eight more years. Do you ever then run into I students? Out. Oh, <laughs> good, bad, and different. No, I had an excellent time teaching. I mean, back then, my first teaching job was in 1956 in Denver, Colorado. Wow. I had 44 students. Oh, wonderful. As wonderful no as Sioux Falls? No help. But it was a different day and age. Mm -hmm. Kids sat in their place. There was no busy time. You didn't have time. It was different, but I burned out. I had four kids of my own, and to keep teaching was just, it was too much. Did you ever think back then when you were teaching and you got all these little kids running around, you ever think what could they be when they grow up, or do you ever wonder about that? I always encouraged them to follow their dreams. But, well, my idea is you never fail if you try something, if it's not immoral or amoral. I throw that in just for the heck of it. But try it. Mm -hmm. I have tried so many things that you might say failed. No, they didn't turn out the way I wanted. So I got out and did something else. Well, I appreciate your time back then because a, a lot of, you know, becoming a firefighter, you don't think that you impress those kids to try things. And my career has been the greatest thing in the world. I and I think it. of you all the time. I love it. Thank I love you it. very much. You're welcome. <laughs> when we talk about worldwide questions, we really mean worldwide questions. This one comes from Maribert in the Philippines, and he wants to know, can you explain some problems that may be experienced when operating a fire pump or a fire truck? 
Well, there's no one more qualified to answer this question than my old good friend, Denny Matthews, driver extraordinaire. Uh, Denny, we're out here, gorgeous day in Sioux Falls, pumping. What are some of the problems that could be experienced running a fire truck at a pump operation? Well, other than the mechanical problems you could have with the truck, something mechanically breaking, you could have somebody run over your supply line. From the line from the hydrant from to the, the truck? From the hydrant to the truck, you lose your water supply. Uh, I had a big pump job one time uh, that the supply line or the hydrant was full of mud. Really? And it just took a long time and pretty soon, whoop, there it came, flushed so, it through the system. So then what happened? I couldn't charge any more lines. I could charge one line. All I had to rely on was the water in the truck. Did you know what was happening at the time? I knew it? I had no supply line. It was you, Normally they're this Five big inches. around. It was this thick. Okay. And all of a sudden it just got hard. The firefighters said it looked like there was chocolate milk coming out of the tip. Well, come to find out, the cap was loose on the hydrant. They think maybe some kids filled it with dirt, something like that. It just took a long time for it to get through which is hard on the truck. What advice would you give to Maribert or a new driver coming on board to say, I'm, I haven't had my first big pump job yet. What are some things I should think about? What are some things that, you, what pieces of advice would you give? The easiest thing you can do is know your equipment inside and out. Know it with your eyes shut and realize that if someone runs over my supply line, this is what I gotta do. If a line gets burst, gets away from a firefighter, this is what I gotta do. I gotta shut the line off. You just have to run these scenarios through your head and it'll come second nature. And this is doing it, you have seconds to do this? Seconds. Now, we're not done with you yet, Denny. We've got another question, so we're gonna find a truck that's free for the next question. Okay. This next question, another truck driving question, comes from Austin. Austin lives in Boca Raton, Florida. And he wants to know, how do you get the wet stuff on the red stuff? Basically, how do you put a truck in a pump gear and how's that process work? So Denny, how do you get this massive, huge truck at the fire, getting it in and putting it in a pump gear so we can make water? Well, when you get to the fire, there's two controls in the cab. Okay. You just flip a lever, push a button. The truck is now has removed itself from gears that drive the wheels to okay, gears so, that drive the so pump. So it's almost like we, we took it out of driving. Driving. And now we're gonna... Now we're in pumping. So you can't drive and pump at the same time. Not with I'm, this truck. Okay. Some trucks you can, but most of them don't. Okay, so now we got it, got in the pump gear, then what do you do? Well, the firefighters will usually pull a line off right Just away. Just like we got lines off here. Right, we got lines off. off all over. The truck is in pump gear. I'm going to want to get my water from my tank to my pump. Okay. So this valve is open. The water's on its way there. Prime the pump. You have to evacuate the air out of there so the water comes in. Charge your line whichever line it may be. While that, while I've done that, the firefighters have water to put the fire out. Okay. 500 gallons, that's it. A lot, of, well, a lot of water there. Right, but not usually enough. The other firefighter is hooked onto the hydrant over there. So that is my job here. next, is to get a supply line. Okay. So I'll hook this five inch up into this big valve. So right once here. we got this hooked up, we have an unlimited supply of water for the most part. Mm -hmm. Unless somebody drives over. Yep. I'll open this little air bleeder right here because I don't want to inject air into the pump. So all the air is going to come out of this hose all the way back to the hydrant. It's going to come right out to here. Turn this on, let the air out, boom, done. And you're good to go. Good to go. You make it sound simple, but I've seen a lot of guys sweat over doing this, Denny. Yeah, you just know your stuff. Thanks. You're the man. This next question is from Mike. Mike lives in Pineville, Arkansas. He wants to know more about the foam systems we use. How do we use them? Why do we use them? And I got the guy to answer the questions, the guy doing the training, Kendall Ward. Kendall, you're a trainer, Tim. especially looking at these foam systems. What are the different, first, what are the different types of foam? Well, we have uh, class A foam. We use it on uh, ordinary combustibles, uh, being house, like fires, house fires, hay bales, We've done you. that before on yep. Fire Call. Watch one of the earlier episodes, you'll see it. Okay. And we've got Class B uh, foam, which is on your petroleum type fires, uh, gasoline, uh, diesel fuel, that type of deal. And then we have a Class B uh, alcohol resistant foam, especially with today's day and age, we use uh, ethanol type sure. fire uh, fuels, such as uh, E85 and, and even the 10% ethanol, we got alcohol in there. Now, this foam here can work to put those out. 
Do you still foam down the runways and the planes are coming in? No, they don't do that oh, anymore. Kind of. <laughs> That's they, thing of the past. Thing of the past. The foam they used back then was a protein foam, is uh, what they used to call a blood foam almost. Sure. And they had it on these uh, great big tankers, and they just go down the runway and shoot it out there. Well, they did away with that years ago. The days are gone. Yes. Now, when we look at using this foam for fires, you got a, the heat coming off these petroleum fires is just incredible. How oh, does yeah. that foam put that fire out? The foam that we use, uh, aqueous film forming foam, and what that does is uh, there's moist water in the bubble, and there's chemical properties that when when the foam's applied, it drains off and it forms a film across the surface. And then that blocks out the vapors on the, from the fuel. And by blocking out the vapors, it then puts the fire out. So when we put that foam on there, we spray it across, shut the, shut the nozzle down, and then that, vape, that foam or film forms, spreads out across the surface, and fire goes out. How long does that film last across that petroleum product if, if you just had a really roaring fire? It varies on the size of the fire, the type of the fuel, how hot it is, and then how good your quality of foam is. If you're not using the right nozzle, you don't have enough aeration to it, or there's too much, uh, your percentages aren't right, there's a lot of variables to it. So this is a real there. science when you lay down foam. It's just not just throw some foam out there. It has to be the right pressure for yep. water, the right aeration rates. It's yes. quite a process. Oh, yeah. Uh, like today, we use an inline eductor. It's an older style of foam production but you have to have the right pressure to the in inlet side and then you have to match your gallons per minute on your nozzle to your uh, eductor. Like ours today was a 95 gallon per minute eductor and we have to match that on the nozzle. So, so that the pressure e is equal at the nozzle where it's coming out at yeah. throughout the whole system. It's not, e there's a friction loss you have to figure in there. Sure. So when you figure your friction loss, it puts out the appropriate gallons at the nozzle to match that eductor, thus giving you a good foam. And then if you put on an aerator, like, uh, we, this, the, like we had earlier, the, the and little... Todd Lowe has shown us one of those before. The, yes. Yep. You put one of those on, that adds air to your stream, thus promoting more air into the bubble, into the foam, making a better blanket for it. Now, we're talking about foam, and that's going to lead us right into... Truck of the month isn't necessarily a truck, it's a trailer. We started talking about foam. This whole purpose of this trailer is to get the foam to the fire. And Kendall's gonna walk us right through how do we do that. So Kendall, tell us a little bit about this trailer. How what's the concept behind it? Uh, the concept behind this trailer was made for the alcohol type fires, the uh, the ethanol type fires that we could run into, or being as we got uh, ethanol plants now, there's a lot more pure alcohol going down the railways and highways. So, so it's we, made for those type of incidents. Where we might need a lot of foam. A lot of foam. We have, uh, in the front of the trailer, we have five gallon pails of what's uh, uh, is a one, one, three percent, one slash three, you can use either percentage with it, depending on what type of fire you're fighting, either just a petroleum based or an alcohol with petroleum base in it, or a, a petroleum base with alcohol in it. Um, in the back of the trailer, we have 55 gallon drums of the same same exact foam, it's just larger quantities. Uh, the, the so if we're using our inline inductors, we probably use the five gallons. Yes. And then on the on a hose line. Yes. And then when we use the guns, we're going to we, be using the... 55 gallon drums. Because when we use the inductors on the, on the guns on the top up here, they put out three... Each nozzle is rated for 350 gallons a minute. And when they put that out, we found that... Uh, by putting a, the eductor tube in a five gallon pail, we can drain it in 12 seconds, is how quick that goes. Wow. So it, it goes awfully fast. So you can see why using a 55 gallon drum over a five gallon pail is more beneficial. We keep that blanket going. When we look at this trailer and we have the call go out, we have a large uh, amount of foam needed. We just take this truck and we get it to the fire by putting behind one of our utility vehicles behind a utility vehicle or uh, we have a truck out here that we bring. Uh, you're probably looking at it now. That's our uh, training center uh, utility truck. We also have a few trucks on the, out at the stations that we can pull it with. Perfect. Kendall, thanks a lot for showing us the truck of the month. Welcome to the Fire Institute of Technology, where we take time to answer those tough 
thinking questions. This question comes from all the way from Rome, New York, and it's from Keith. Keith wants to know all about smoke detectors. He wants to know how they work. He wants to know where they should be placed. And he wants to know what best brands to buy. Now, sometimes I can't answer all these questions. My brain is just working too much. I just can't answer everything. So I brought with me Russ Downs. Russ, wear your glasses. Got you them right here, Jim. Got to have glasses. Got them right here. I'm not going to be the only one that looks silly. <laughs> and there we go. Okay. Russ is a fire inspector, correct? That is correct, Jim. With Sioux Falls Fire Rescue. Right. How long have you been on the department, Russ? Uh, 22 and a half years. Wow. How long have you been an inspector? For about 17 and a half. Okay. 16. So you, this is this is Kate <laughs> question for you. Right. Easy. Okay, so we got to ask answer Keith's question. How do these smoke detectors work? What's give us kind of a rundown on, on the the brains behind that little little plastic box. Mm -hmm. Well, I'm glad he asked that. That's a good question. It's very good. We only picked yep. the best questions. Here. <laughs> That's right. There are two types of uh, smoke detectors, and mm -hmm. you've probably heard about these. One is a photoelectric, and the other one is the ionization. Okay. You know, and they work a little bit different. It's kind of like a watch. You can have a a watch that has the, the natural numbers on it right. uh, that light up, or you can have a watch that has the hands. They both tell time, but they do it completely different. Okay. And that's, that's good analogy. That's, that's how we explain it. Okay. Um, the photoelectric works on a... Can I go to the board? Use the board, the magic board. Yes. Wait a minute. I'm going to get the other end of this thing. The photoelectric, basically inside, you have this tube that runs like this. Okay. Uh, there's a sensor here that shoots a beam out. Normally the beam just travels through, heads out into space. Nothing. Nothing. Not doing anything. Okay. However, if you have a fire in your house, you're going to have smoke, right? Right. The smoke is going to travel up into this chamber here. The smoke is coming in. The beam hits this smoke and it's reflected down and it hits a sensor at the bottom here, setting off the alarm. Oh, so it's like that, that's what hits the switch, essentially. Right. It's just like when you go into a door of a store. Mm -hmm. you, you walk through a beam, the doorbell rings or whatever. Basically, that's what this is doing. It's breaking the beam, shooting it down here. It's okay. pretty simple. Okay. That's how they work. What's, now, you said there's another kind. Yes. That would be the ionization, which most of the ones in your home are going to be ionization because they are the cheap, inexpensive, inexpensive type. Run on batteries. Yep. Okay. What they have, they have a... Uh, a big plate here, another plate here. Uh, these are hooked to a nine volt battery. And, oops, <laughs> that ain't right. Anyway, they're hooked to a nine volt battery. Okay. There's a small amount of radioactivity on one of the plates, radioactive material. Very small amount, not dangerous. It's not going to hurt you, not it's going to turn you green. Yeah, that's okay. right. What this radioactivity does, it creates an ions coming up here, and it allows for an electrical charge to travel from one plate down to the next, okay. which, is, which is measured. It's a constant. Constant charge, always the same voltage. When smoke comes in here, the ions in the smoke okay. intermix with these, and they cancel out some of the ones creating uh, a voltage drop. Okay. Once the voltage drop, the alarm goes off, you got a fire. So essentially, the smoke comes in here, can't work. Yep. Breaks it. Right. Rings the bell. The yep, current can't get across there. Rings the bell. Now, what kind would you advise to get? What kind? Well, it depends. These ionization, they work better in a, in a flaming fire, okay. or so they say. This photoelectric works better in a smoldering fire. Now, we give out, Sioux Falls Fire Rescue, we give out smoke detectors. Free right. of charge to the public. That's true. What, what kind do we give out? We give out the ionization ones. Okay. Simply because they are um, a little less expensive and we can give more to more people. Cover it, blank the city with as many as we can get. That's right. Okay, now, Keith's, Keith's, Keith's going to write us back because right. he's going to say, you didn't answer all my questions. How many should we place in a home, and where should we put these detectors? Okay. Now, how many? Well, it depends on how big your home is, of course. Okay, it's not but, like your house. Probably no. not the average house. Yeah. Two-story, three-bedroom house. Right. What you'd want is one on each floor. Okay. So, if you have an open basement, one in the basement, uh, one on the main floor, one on the top floor. Where? In the, in the room, where in the, on okay. the floor? In the hallways? They should be located in the bedroom area. Okay. And normally in the hallway outside the bedrooms. Um, also, they need to be located inside of each bedroom. Okay. So if you have a sleeping area on each end of your uh, main floor, you're going to have to have two on that floor because they have to be outside each sleeping area. Okay. So um, 
So one on each floor and the sleeping areas. Yep. You gotta have one on each floor. The one by the sleeping area can count for the one okay. for that floor. And then one in each bedroom. Now the last part of Keith's question, he wants to know what are the best brands. Now we can't give out best brands. No. But what can we do? What you do, you look for the UL listing on the box. And it should be on the back. Uh, it's a little circle, it says UL. That means underwriters laboratories, they've been tested. They're guaranteed to well, pretty much guaranteed to work. Uh, and, and there, if it says UL, those are the those are all yep. been tested and they're yep. they're guaranteed to work mm -hmm. pretty much. If they don't say UL, they could be some coming in from Who China knows where? <laughs> or yeah. where, and they may not work. So it might be, be coming sure from are. Jim and Russ's workshop. We That's don't right. Know. Okay. That's right. Well, Keith, I hope that answers your question. Russ, thanks. Thank and you. We're going to have you back again. All right. Hey, that was a wild show, and we did a lot of good training. Got a couple more shout outs to go. This shout out is from Josh. Josh lives in uh, Lenore, North Carolina. Wants a shout out to the Kings Creek Fire Department, North Carolina. This shout out's from Josh. Josh, oh, Josh, you got a cool one. Josh wants a shout out to the Orlando Fire Department, firehouse number one, the big house, La Casa Grande. This shout out's going out to you, Josh. And our last shout out for the month is from Brian. Brian lives in Bismarck, North Dakota. Yikes, it's gonna get cold there quick. Shout out to the Bismarck Fire Department. Hey, I'm glad you got to be in the show. We got to see a lot of our firefighters. It was, uh, that training they do all the time is great. If you have a question, because we're answering your questions, get on our website, www.siouxfalls.org backslash fire call. If we use it, you're gonna get a t-shirt. And we're sending out a lot of t-shirts to people because we're getting such darn good questions. So I want to thank all our firefighters. Thank you for coming in. And special thanks to Mrs. Randall, my third grade teacher. Hey, hope you're back next month. My name is Division Chief Jim Sedaris, and you've been watching Fire Call.